I'm Jeff Cutmore. It is Friday, the 21st of March. You are watching Squawk Box on CNBC Europe, 8 o'clock in Paris and Frankfurt. A very warm welcome this morning to our viewers who join us in North America, Europe and Asia. Let's bring you up to date here. The battle for Iraq has moved to the country's second largest city, Basra. Reports that Allied aircraft have attacked the city in the south of the country. According to the latest, a unit of US Marines was halted by anti-tank missiles and small arms fire after crossing into Iraq. They're thought to have called in artillery support. A US helicopter has crashed in Kuwait, several miles south of the Iraqi border. 16 American and British troops are reported to have died in what's thought to have been an accident at this stage. And EU leaders divided over the war unite behind a common stance on reconstructing Iraq. Europe demands that the UN take a central role in the country's post-war order. We believe that the UN must continue to play a central role both during and after the current crisis. The UN system has a unique capacity and practical experience in coordinating assistance in post-conflict states. The Security Council should give the United Nations a strong mandate for this mission. And for latest on the rest of the world news stories this morning and continued reaction to what is happening in Iraq, let's get to Serena in the newsroom. Serena. Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. And the White House has said that Turkey will not receive a $30 billion economic aid package, which the U.S. had offered in return for cooperation ahead of war. Washington confirmed that the package is, quote, not on the table and will not be on the table. Earlier, Ankara's parliament had voted to allow America the use of its airspace for the conflict, but fell short of America's original request to deploy 62,000 of its troops on the Turkey-Iraq border. The French Interior Ministry has reported that traces of the deadly poison ricin have been found in the Gare de Lyon railway station in Paris. Reports say that two small flasks containing traces of the poison were discovered in a left luggage depot at the mainline railway station which serves the south of France. Separately in Germany, prosecutors said they have detained five people suspected of planning an attack on German soil to coincide with the start of the war. Other world news making the headlines in North Korea has this morning reportedly warned South Korea to stop its propaganda broadcasts across their shared border or face serious consequences. And separate reports say Pyongyang has also told South Korea it was playing with fire by taking actions to thwart possible North Korean provocations now that the U.S.-led war in Iraq has started. Earlier, Pyongyang made its first comment on the conflict, saying it would have, quote, disastrous consequences. The World Health Organization says it is investigating whether the outbreak of a fatal disease in China is indeed linked to the killer pneumonia that has spread to three continents. It's believed that the killer flu spread from a Hong Kong hotel where a doctor who has been treating patients in China infected seven other people staying on the same floor. Let's wrap up the bulletin with Europe's weather for you. It's going to be fine for much of the Med today. Your top temperatures today, Rome, 16 degrees centigrade, your high today in Athens, 15 as much as you'll get. Heading north, it's going to be pretty cold in Scandinavia, 4 degrees centigrade, your high in Stockholm. Another sunny day in London and Paris today, your high in Paris, 11 degrees centigrade. That brings you up to date with the very latest on the world news front, Jeff. Serena, thanks very much for that. Uh, as is our remit here on CNBC, of course, we will be keeping you across the latest business news developments, any corporate releases, and also we'll be having a good hard look at how the markets trade. Yesterday was a very interesting day. We will not lose sight, though, of the bigger story that is taking place. We have access to MSNBC. We will be showing this throughout the show to make sure that you have the latest details and are kept up to date with the pictures 
from this unfolding drama in the Middle East. So just want to reassure you that you won't miss anything as we spend some time talking about the markets and perhaps uh, some comparisons with 91. And we look at the um, corporate news that we get through this morning. Let's just bring you up to date with a news flash we're getting from the Q8 National Guard. They are now reporting 15 oil wells are alight in the south of Iraq. As we get more details, obviously we'll bring you up to, uh, to date with those. We'll keep a good hard look at the oil price as well. There are clearly consequences and we have seen oil move on the reports of um, fires at these oil wells. Guy Monson is our guest host this morning. Guy is with us for the next two hours to help us give analysis on how the markets are dealing with what is going on in the Middle East. Guy is a partner at Saracen Investment Management. A very good morning to you, Guy. Very good morning. Thank you very much for being with Pleasure. us this morning here on Squawkbox. Also coming up on the show, we will talk with Yves Boyer. He is a researcher at the Foundation for Strategic Research. We will talk with him about the long-term effect on the European Union of the conflict. He'll be with us in about 10 minutes' time. Colonel Philip Wilkinson is a former SAS commander, now talks at King's College in the UK. We will look at the military strategy in place in Iraq. Secretary of uh, Defense Donald Rumsfeld has talked a lot about how there will be one large dramatic military push into the country. This, although it looks like an effective military push into Iraq, does not appear to be, in terms of scale, what Donald Rumsfeld was describing. We will talk about this in about 15 minutes' time with our friend from King's College. Kevin Rosser is a Middle East analyst at the Controls Risk Group. He believes the war has resulted in a much more immediate threat to business people abroad. We will speak to him at 9.25 Central European time. We will find out how he quantifies that threat to business people and what perhaps you and I can do to minimize the risk. Also. The issue of humanitarian aid in post-war Iraq is under discussion. Paul Nielsen is European Commissioner for Development and Humanitarian Aid. He will join us live from Brussels at 8.50 Central European time. Raymond Franken will give us the latest from Brussels on the latest EU-US wranglings. That at 9.15 Central European time. And at 9.35, we examine what history tells us about the way the markets behave during war. John Littlewood is a stock market historian. He will join us in the studio at 9.30 Central European time. 9.30 Paris Frankfurt time. That is, of course, an hour ahead of GMT for our viewers who are watching in the UK. A little bit of uh, economic data to bring you up to date with. This has just crossed the wire. German February PPI up 0.4% month on month, up 1.9% year on year. German February PPI annual rate then seen the highest since September 2001. That'll give Wim Dausenberg just another piece of information to deal with as he thinks about interest rate policy for the Eurozone. Okay, lots of consequences from the ongoing activities in the Gulf. Let's get to Guy Johnson out on our markets desk talk a little bit about the consequences for the airline sector. Guy. Well, airline and the aerospace sector, Jeff, obviously coming under intense pressure. When you look at the aerospace sector, you've obviously got to divide it between the military and the civil, though many companies obviously focus on both. The aviation sector, though, finding it very tough during these times. Obviously, we've seen S&P talking about ratings downgrades. We've talked about a number of airlines cutting flights. We're talking about transatlantic flights likely to be hit again. Will it be a short war? That is the question that many people are asking themselves. Will the travellers return and how will the industry respond to that? We're already talking about potential bankruptcies over in the United States, so there's lots going on. So what we're going to do is divide this between the aviation sector, the carriers as it were, uh, the travel industry, and then we'll take a look at the aerospace industry and figure out how that's been going. Louisa, why don't you kick off and talk about the, uh, the aviation side of it? Yeah, Guy, we're just getting news in right now on KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, and they're saying uh, that they've suspended more flights to the Middle East uh, and uh, that they've reduced the number of connections to other regions also due to the war uh, in Iraq, and that that has led to lower demand than uh, uh, in, in turn. KLM, they've said that after the flight reductions, the capacity will be 7% lower than last year, and they're just yet uh, one of the numerous, numerous airlines that have cut back in capacity. 
capacity due to uh, a, a lower demand from the passenger side. And as Guy was saying, it's really the transatlantic flights that have been hit the hardest. The domestic flights are doing better, but the transatlantic flights, they're the ones uh, that are in trouble. And this goes both for uh, the from the uh, Asian airlines, for an example, reducing their flights into major, U uh, major U.S. cities, for an example, uh, L.A. and New York, but also vice versa, of course, the U.S. airline sector, which is the sector that's been hit uh, the hardest. Uh, they're really the ones that are in trouble uh, with their flights to the Middle East and, of course, also the European carriers with their flights uh, to the Middle East as well. Uh, we're also looking at, for an example, as Guy was mentioning, the U.S. carriers, uh, two of the major U.S. carriers, American Airlines, they've cut back uh, their capacity by some 6% as a direct response to the war. So as KLM, uh, we are looking at uh, quite a large direct response to the war. And also uh, what we've seen, interestingly enough, however, though, just within this past week, take a look here, Guy, because you're looking at Lufthansa, for an example, having gained 12%, 13% just within this past week. Why is that? Well, that's, of course, a direct response to what we've seen within the oil prices uh, this past week as well. Brent having fallen by 14.6%, and NYMEX Guy also off of quite a lot. And you may know that one cent rise in a gallon of jet fuel per year is equal to 600 million U.S. dollar in costs. And, of course, that's vice versa. And also, when we're looking at falling, uh, falling fuel prices. It takes quite a lot to run an airplane. It does. And that's the biggest, the second biggest cost, isn't it, associated with that? It second is, to exactly. Wages, wages first so, and then And, and, and then it's cost. probably the most volatile. They can fix wages for quite a long period of time. They obviously have to hedge against the, uh, the uh, movements in the oil price, but that obviously becomes very expensive over a long period of time as well. So that's what's been happening in the aviation sector. Uh, what's been happening within the aerospace sector? Well, you've got two main manufacturers out there, EADS and Boeing. This is EADS over the last 12 months. Yesterday we were down just a fraction, but as you can see, the share price has been declining over the last year. This is how, by how much. We're down nearly 50% on EADS's share price. Remember, this is 80% owner of Airbus, vying 50-50 at the moment in world markets uh, for um, control of the, uh, the civil market. Uh, unlike Boeing over in the United States, it doesn't have a major, major defense side of the business. Now, that many people see as being a significant weakness for EADS and could come as being uh, quite a big hit when these two companies start to report results in the future. Boeing is still down heavily over the last year, down some 40.9%. But what happens to some of these European defense companies as a result of the war? Well, you've got to remember, we're talking about uh, the French reaction here, effectively, and what the US feels uh, about what it uh, sees as being some, some um, fairly um, Difficult comments coming out from um, the uh, the French. Basically, what we could see is a change in policy towards EADS and Thales. Both have been trying to build slowly their defense businesses up in the United States. BAE may be the major beneficiary of this because of the UK's support to Washington. Europe only spends around 30% of what is spent over by the Department of Defense in the United States. As a result of which, you could see uh, the US um, military really being a major benefit of, benefit of this. Uh, we've also got news just coming through the possible impact on, on the ATS and Boeing on the civil side, which could be uh, that we may see a short impact if the, if the, the war is on, pro if the, a short impact on profits as the war is short, uh, and airlines, so certainly going to be here. But we've got news coming through from Air France right now. That's a good place to leave it, Jeff. Air France saying its pilot union has called a new strike between March the 28th and April the 4th. Problems ahead, I would suspect, for many of these carriers. Jeff, back to All you. All right, Guy, thanks very much for that. Impeccable timing there, it would seem, from the French unions. Guy, let's come to you here and talk a little bit about the prospects for the airline sector. Uh, not the best of investments over the last two years anyway. This just seems to compound the woes. Yes, I'm afraid it's one of those industries you can't just take short, sharp trading opportunities in, but if you invest for the long term, it's almost certain value destruction. But I think one clear opportunity does come out of all of this today. I've been looking forward to accumulating a Ryanair position um, over the last um, month or two. I began about two weeks ago. The stock's up about 13% over the last five days. It's trading now on just 17 times forward earnings. It's got about 400 billion of free cash. It's the only airline other than EasyJet out there in Europe that's buying planes, that launch, that's launching new routes, and there's gathering market share. And one must remember that October of 2000, uh, I mean, immediately after 9-11, that October month was one of their best months seen. Mm. Now, I think that the credit downgrades at BA and potentially at Lufthansa offer a wonderful opportunity there. So buy the best. Mm. 
they're really only a European airline, so we don't get a lot of the travel problems you've got across the Atlantic and take advantage of this weakness. A couple of bits of information from Ryanair and EasyJet that make you wonder if the easy money has already been made in that sector. EasyJet backing away from the Deutsche BA acquisition that they talked about there. That deal now not taking place and Ryanair as we have seen has been uh, very aggressive in cutting staff after its recent acquisition. Uh, just makes you wonder whether you need to pause for breath here and take another look at the valuations on these businesses given the stock ratings right now. Yeah. I think they're quite encouraging both those um, transactions, particularly the Deutsche BA. They, you know, they show that the management of both those companies say, if the model is right, if we cannot achieve the savings, if we don't, in Ryanair's case, get the advantages of the deals we hope to get from travelling to regional airports, we yeah. simply won't make the transaction or will aggressively close the routes that we've had. I mean, the capital price they paid for Buzz was almost insignificant. So really, it's the operational gains from here that we're interested in. So the more aggression and the more determination to stick to their business model, the better. If they don't operate through acquisition, they will operate through um, direct organic growth. And at the moment, they haven't got much competition with the other airlines because of credit problems. It's a typical of what I would call a survival of the fittest theme stock. Guy, we'll come back. We'll talk some more with you. Guy Monson, our guest host this morning. You want to join us? You want to talk about what we're, what we're delivering to you? Or talk to Guy Monson. Scorebox at CNBCEurope.com. That is our email address. Let's get you an update now. MSNBC provides the latest for us. We're going to get you caught up in the latest headlines. This is an Operation Iraqi Freedom, as we are doing every quarter hour for you round the clock. Beginning with this, U.S.-led forces continue their ground assault from Kuwait into Iraq after a series of artillery barrages. British troops have stormed the al Fal Peninsula, the head of the Persian Gulf. That is a key route for oil tanker traffic. You just heard my colleague, NBC's Forrest Sawyer, telling us that it is believed those British troops have now taken control of the al Fal Peninsula. Meanwhile, huge explosions. They are heard near the southern Iraqi city of Basra. U.S. officials are saying that intelligence strongly indicates that Saddam was still inside the bunker. Possibly he was injured. All of this when that bunker was hit on Wednesday night. And the Washington Post is reporting that U.S. officials knew that Saddam was making taped statements all in anticipation of Wednesday's deadline. Pentagon officials say no hostile fire involved in the crash of a U.S. Marine helicopter, much like the one you're going to see shortly on your screen. It was a CH-46 sea night. It went down in Kuwait, killing all 16 aboard. We're told there were four Americans believed to be Marines, also 12 British uh, paratroopers, we believe. The sea night was assigned to the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force. We, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, strategic situation now. MSNBC, our sister station, has brought us up to date with exactly what is happening on the ground in Iraq. I think useful at this point to talk to someone who has military experience and also uh, now is able to perhaps look from some distance at the whole scene. Uh, Philip Wilkinson is a senior research fellow at King's College. He is ex-Special Forces. Uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. Nice to have you with us. Um, as you see the ground war unfolding at this stage, what do you think the overall strategy is from the Pentagon? Because Donald Rumsfeld kept telling us it was, it was going to be Blitzkrieg style. Big, sharp, possibly a short action that would be very very violent in its nature it seems somewhat different i think what we are seeing now is the ability to inject tactical pauses in the operation to allow for um, the surrender of the Iraqi forces. I mean there is enormous concern as to causing unnecessary casualties. You know this, this campaign is directed against the leadership not against the Iraqi people, not necessarily against the Iraqi army, only those who fight. So what we are trying to do is to introduce tactical pauses to cause them, to give them time to turn themselves over to surrender. Do you think Donald Rumsfeld really was in the business of spinning for the purposes of uh, making the uh, Iraqi leadership feel that they were going to see something else happen here? I and mean, I'm just wondering if there is further down the road a shockwave of larger forces well, to be employed. Th th there has been this debate throughout the operational planning whether to take the 
Rumsfeld option, if you like, the overwhelming force. That is the way one would traditionally expect the Americans to go. The Brits, being more cautious, have been trying to push this line of tactical pauses. Take a bite, take a pause, see what is going to happen, and take the prisoners. But, but I think we could well see that there is flexibility, sufficient flexibility, in the conduct of the operation such that if something occurs that requires there to be a use of overwhelming force, that will happen. I, I think it's an inherently flexible plan that they put together and it will be determined by the amount of Iraqis that surrender. Uh, Louisa, join us here. Philip, do you think that there's a chance that the Iraqi forces have been underestimated? I, I think not. I mean, I, I do really believe that there is going to be um, a major collapse of, of the Iraqi forces. I know within the, the MOD, they are talking, are, the, the, the buzz cry at the moment is of a catastrophic victory. And what we are really worried about now is that the, the whole sort of edifice of the Iraqi hierarchy will implode upon itself and collapse, and we will be swamped by not only a humanitarian disaster, but prisoners, but also, I have to say, by the 4,000 media who are there who are looking for something to report. Now, if the campaign comes to an early closure, what on earth are we going to do? Guy. Philip, what does he do when his back is against the wall, finally? I, I think at that stage it is highly likely that if he has the infrastructure left in place that he will use, his chemical or biological weapons. I think what we have to do is isolate him from the means of communications to, to, if you like, isolate him from the triggers such that he cannot initiate weapons of mass destruction when it gets to that stage that he determines it is time to do so. This is, uh, this is the, well, we're, we've been showing the latest video here on MSNBC uh, of further explosions in Baghdad. We'll pop these pictures back up as we get something that's worth looking at here. But I'm interested in, in the strategy as far as Baghdad itself is concerned. So far, it seems as though the Allies have pursued this cruise missile, very precise targeting of palaces and other buildings around Iraq. Obviously, they're trying to limit the collateral damage at this mm. stage. It would seem, though, inevitable to me that that damage is going to escalate once it becomes a, a, a ground attack in Baghdad. It, it, it would if we, if we go in on the ground, but I, I know that there has been enormous concern about what we in the British Army call fighting in built-up areas, what the Americans call MAWAT, which is military operations in an urban terrain. There's been an enormous amount of cooperation ever since Mogadishu. Uh, and the American sort of initiatives in this area have been led by the, the Marines, the US Marine Corps, supported by RAND. But the UK has been doing a great deal of work to share our experiences for fighting in built-up areas. So we have been training and practicing for this immensely hard. However, whatever happens, and no matter how good you are at Mount or Fibua, whatever we want to call it, it is going to be casualty intensive, an awful expression. So we are going to avoid it. I mean, the, the aim will be to, to invest Baghdad, to surround Baghdad, to cut off supplies, but hopefully not create a humanitarian disaster, but then leave the, the sort of elimination of the Special Republican Guard, the 15,000, they're the bad guys. I think that they will eventually be taken out by the Iraqi people themselves. We're getting a, a report through from MSNBC. They say the Pentagon is confirming that Saddam Hussein was in the bunker that was struck uh, 24 hours or so ago. Um, they say, though, at this stage, they don't know whether he was injured and what the casualty count was. We'll tell you more as we get it through here. Guy Monson, you wanted to join the discussion. Well, what, would, what would you, for us, look, looking just at the limited information we have, what are the sort of indicators that we should be looking for to see this campaign sort of proceeding to schedule? What, uh, and what sort of things should, should we look out for, for, for trouble or for delay or for a real unexpected problem emerging? What is really interesting right now is what we are not seeing. We all know what the Orbat are. We know what forces there are. Uh, I mean, we know that the, the 4th Mech Division is stuck in the Eastern Mediterranean and, you know, the, the plan was to try and get them into Kirkut, into northern Iraq. But where is the 101st Airborne, where's the 82nd, where's 16 Assault? Where are all of the paratroopers? Where's the Airborne right now? I mean, what is happening? I mean, we don't know, and certainly Saddam doesn't know, and of course, 
he doesn't need to know and we need to confuse him by causing him not to know. So, you know, if we are going to attack him in every dimension that we possibly can, we need to confuse him. We need to get inside his decision-making cycle and he needs to be induced into a state of panic or his subordinates need to be induced into a state of panic. The next thing I think we have to look for is what the airborne are going to do because I think that one of the major concerns that we have to have is what's going to happen in northern Iraq. I mean there is the potential there for conflict between Turks and Kurds uh, and you know that would be a disaster. Th there, are, um, there are Iraqi um, forces who have been who are against Saddam two corps that have been operating from within Iran now they are poised on the border of Iraq if they come in they are complications that we just do not need at this stage so I think what we need to see is is the operational battle space isolated and contained and then we will see what actually happens inside and I think you will see a series of progressive steps taken, chunks if you like, with casualties, with tactical pauses, but eventually Baghdad will be isolated, it will be contained and then I think there will be a major pause to give the people inside Baghdad the opportunity to do what is necessary. And I know one of the major concerns is, and this sounds absolutely awful and callous, is whether the lamp posts are actually going to be street lamps, are going to be strong enough to sustain the number of the Special Republican Guard that are going to be hung from them. I mean, the, the potential for a bloodbath is, is ghastly. And I think that's one of the problems we're going to have to face at some stage, how we're going to intervene to stop the sort of the horrible things that are likely to happen. The, the, this report that we're, we're getting now from MSNBC, which suggests that Saddam Hussein was in fact in yeah. that location as, as that bunker was, was struck here. The, the Americans, uh, we've talked a lot about this over the 20, last 24 hours, the Americans appear to have pursued a decapitation strategy by trying to get Saddam Hussein here. We have little detail about whether he is injured or whether some of the other uh, senior members of the government have been injured at this stage. Uh, what difference does that make to the fighting capability of an, an Iraqi force if Saddam Hussein is at this point unable to give accurate communication to them? Well, the, the way the Allies have categorized the Iraqis, there's three lists. There is a black list, which are those who have to go. They are the people who are known as war criminals, Saddam Hussein obviously being the greatest of them all. There is then a grey list, which is those people who perhaps are, and then there is a white list, which are people that we are saying if you surrender no problem now if we can eliminate we're going to have to do something about the blacklist but if you take off the head of, of this beast then of course the rest will implode because it is only the dictatorial control that is exercised from the top which is keeping it together take that away and the whole edif edifice will crumble very good to talk with you this morning thank you very much My for coming pleasure. in thank Colonel you. Philip Wilkinson senior research fellow at King's College and uh, uh, member of the Special Forces previously. Nice to, to, to talk with you. Guy, how does this translate for markets? Here we are, we're, we've talked a lot about the wall of worry over recent years. We seem to be climbing another one about the headlines that are coming out from Iraq at the moment. The markets are taking it in their stride though. We have a stock market historian later on to add detail to this, but my basic research shows that in general, following a big uh, event such as a war, such as a Cuban Missile Crisis, such even as the first oil crisis, you tend to get a positive reaction in global equity markets. On average, from my figures, you get after, say, three weeks, a 5% move uh, over the last 50 years, uh, after um, uh, three months, about an 8 or 9% move, and on average, a 16% increase in equity markets over the uh, 10 months following the, 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 the beginning of a crisis. From, from my numbers, the, the best move was the Cuban Missile Crisis, where we got almost 17% return from equity markets. From the Gulf, we got 24% after the last Gulf War and the nine months that followed. So what we've seen so far, I think, is fairly typical, beginning a day or two before the market, before the event actually begins. To me, the key indicator short term is oil prices. Now, are... I'm going to have to interrupt you here. We've got to get an update from MSNBC. Let's, let's take that now and we'll come back and we'll talk some more about how the markets are moving.
efforts to capture the key southern Iraqi city of Basra. Also, the BBC News now reporting that scores of Iraqi troops have surrendered to British Royal Marine Commandos operating in southern Iraq. Officials at U.S. Central Command now say that 12 casualties in the crash of a U.S. Marine helicopter in Kuwait are confirmed. The Pentagon officials say, however, no hostile fire was involved in that crash of the CH-46. That sea night went down, killing all 12 on board, four Americans and eight British. The sea night was assigned to the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force. Meantime, the U.S. Senate unanimously approved a resolution in support of all those forces. This resolution expressed gratitude to the troops, their families, also offered support for the president as our commander-in-chief. It also thanked British Prime Minister Tony Blair and his government in the U.K. for their support. We will recap the latest headlines on the Iraqi crisis for you every 15 minutes. And you can also get the very latest anytime on our web. To do that, go to iraq.msnbc.com. Gentlemen, uh, I want to get back with you, retired Marine Major Jack Stradley, also Dan Garay. Let's get back to the attacks, the assaults and on Iraq. And, of course, we Again, will continue to bring you those MSNBC updates here on CNBC. Uh, and we will continue to monitor uh, this feed from our sister station. If anything interesting happens or we get some pictures that illustrate the progress of the war, then we will, of course, bring those to you. Uh, yesterday was uh, an interesting session for European Union uh, ministers. The European Council leaders met in somber mood as deep divisions over the war in Iraq put a strain on the Union. A joint statement did, however, commit support to the United Nations humanitarian efforts and urged the UN to give a, quote, central role during and after the crisis. But what does the difference in opinion mean for the future of the European Union? And for us market watchers here, what consequences then for the euro and economic progress for the eurozone? Eve Boyer is a researcher at the Foundation for Strategic Research. He comes to us live now from Paris. Eve, a very good morning to you. Uh, it looked like a very testy gathering yesterday of leaders and Iraq inevitably dominated. Just how serious are these fissures between uh, leading uh, government members? They are very, very, uh, the situation is very difficult in, in a way and there is a very strange paradox now in the sense that the Gulf uh, dividing uh, EU leaders, particularly on one hand the UK and on the other hand the French, is really widening and at the same time there is a need to further the, the construction of the European Union. So there is a kind of a paradox. Um, and uh, the Gulf is very wide. And for for view from Paris, uh, the, the problem is uh, uh, in substance and in the form. Regarding the form, I think that the, the French position has been portrayed in the Anglo-Saxon uh, by the Anglo-Saxon at best uh, as a caricature or at worst uh, with a lot of insult. So the form has been there and uh, we need now to, to, to get uh, together. Uh, regarding the substance, the, the dividing line between the UK and, and France is, is about uh, the role of multinational multi organization, the place of the United States in the international scene, uh, and uh, really we have to probably to work very hard, uh, both in London and in Paris, to find uh, at the end uh, a compromise. And as you know, uh, next year will be the 100th anniversary of the Entente Cordiale. Uh, and one can hope that at this time, uh, London will have made a move toward Paris and vice versa. Yves, how do, you, how do you qualify that? These countries have had differences in the past over issues. Uh, we have seen uh, each country's media caricature the other. I, I think back to the um, the problems in the UK over beef and how the French media uh, played out the way that the British government was dealing with that issue. That itself could have been a uh, serious problem for future diplomatic relations between our two countries. It never came to pass. I wonder if we are exaggerating the consequences of this for greater European cooperation. 
Well, um, I, I will not uh, talk a lot about the form, but really we get the feeling here in France and the French political leaders and the French people that really are, uh, the French position has been caricatured and a lot of insults have been thrown to, to the French. Uh, and really it's, uh, it uh, has created a lot of wound here. Um, but beside uh, that, uh, there is uh, the feeling that if uh, London maintains his line, uh, which is really to align with the United States, the, the, probably one of the issues for the French will be uh, in the term of uh, foreign uh, affairs and defense affairs to work uh, with the German to build uh, a kind of uh, European defense policy uh, in the framework of reinforced cooperation, that is to say, a small group of countries uh, accepting together to go further and to develop genuinely uh, European defense, which uh, uh, European defense identity, which will, of course, be left open to the other, but the lead or the impulse will be given both by uh, Berlin, Paris, with may probably a few other countries uh, willing to join them to develop uh, European defense and foreign uh, policy. Guy. Eva, uh, uh, it's Guy Munson from Saracen here. W what are the practical consequences of this in terms of the issues uh, in the EU that need to be discussed over the coming months that could be delayed or affected in some way? Uh, and what's the impact on financial markets? Well, uh, in a way, uh, I think that present crisis may, may lead to uh, the, uh, the following situation. On one hand, it will be the, the success of uh, uh, British uh, ideas or British views about the EU, that is to say, a big market, a big market and large to new countries coming from the East and Central Europe. So on one hand, it will be the croning of the process and it will be a success for the, for the British. On the other hand, uh, it, may also, it may also lead to the development of the notion of what we call Europe puissance, that is to say a core group of countries deciding to move ahead from this market and really uh, build, develop, construct on, uh, uh, in a small number of countries, develop, construct foreign policy and defense policy, but without a lot of countries uh, because those countries are not yet ready to uh, develop or to uh, develop together or to accept that there is a sense of I European identity which uh, is at, has its own interest and its own uh, view of the world, its own view of multi multinational uh, organization. And probably we, we run the risk to, to move in that uh, two direction, the triumph of the British idea, big market, and the success of the French idea, Europe puissance being built, being developed. Yves, thank you very much for that. We uh, appreciate thank you, you taking much. the time to join us, and we all hope for the best here. Yves Boyer, researcher at the Foundation for Strategic Research, joining us live from Paris. Uh, just a couple of things that I want to tell you about. We are getting a little bit more news about fires in uh, southern Iraq at oil fields. There are currently reports coming in from the UK that there are several oil well heads on fire in southern Iraq and that British troops are moving towards them. The Kirkuk oil fields may have been secured by US forces. The BBC is quoting intelligence sources. Uh, we will get to Jessica Yellen in just a few minutes who will come to us from Washington. Jessica is NBC's correspondent. Uh, she will come to us from the NBC Bureau in Washington. Hopefully we will get an update on the latest situation from the heart of the US government. Let's see what the uh, oil price has been doing in the context of reports of fires at oil fields in southern Iraq. As you can see, generally the trend has been for the price to rise here. Uh, we've come down a little bit from the peaks through this session but we are generally much firmer on the Pentagon reports. Uh, one of the other things that was said during yesterday's EU session uh, was said in the context of how 
uh, European governments are going to manage their economic policy. Wim Dausenberg, the president of the European Central Bank, made some remarks suggesting that the ECB could be flexible on interest rate policy. Uh, I think on the program yesterday, regular viewers will remember seeing Pedro Solbus, the EU's Economic Affairs Commissioner, confirming that he considered these exceptional circumstances now for the growth and stability pact. Let's get some analysis on what we've heard from the European Central Bank. Neil Parker is a Treasury economist at the Royal Bank of Scotland. Neil, that must have been uh, manner to the ears of those in the markets who've been urging the ECB to cut rates for some time. Uh, yes, certainly. And I think that as far as um, a lot of the survey and, uh, and, and the, the large um, institutional uh, banks are concerned. They, they've been calling for interest rate cuts literally ever since the March 6th interest rate cut because they felt that 25 basis points wasn't enough. I'd have to say we tend to agree with that. We were, we were predicting 50 basis points and I still think in spite of the movements in the euro that we've seen weaken uh, somewhat as um, war has become inevitable, I think that there is still the case for further interest rate cuts from the European Central Bank. Uh, Neil, how have the markets reacted to the suggestion? Um, well, I think that they really uh, have too much of their attention focused upon Iraq at the moment, and so uh, they haven't really reacted. In fact, interest rate futures are, are, are virtually unchanged, whereas one would have expected that there would have been a rally. But with the equity markets having gained, I think that has um, stemmed the tide of uh, interest rate futures rallies for the time being. They still have uh, further interest rate cuts priced in anyway, so I think, uh, or at least a risk rather. So I think that um, they're, they're happy with the position that they're in at the moment, and of course mindful of the fact that there could be further uh, war euphoria-related rallies in the equity markets. How do, we, how do we factor in the firmer inflation? indicators like PPI out of Germany which seems to be stronger this morning than anticipated this will give them some pause to, pause for thought I suspect but how do you what is it in in the um, in the pricing at the moment that is pushing these indicators higher is it oil yes I think it is I mean it, it's predominantly energy price led um, I do think there are there are some signs of of increases in prices more generally, um, but it's but it's generally being driven by by the push higher in commodity prices, which in turn the commodity prices have been led by oil, um, and uh, and I think that there's there's prospect for commodity prices to continue to gain, even though the oil price has slipped back, um, and therefore if we were just purely looking at uh, producer price inflation, one might say that there was evidence that the, the ECB should stay their hands. But is it filtering through onto the, onto the retail side of the economy? It doesn't look like it is. And with domestic demand so weak in Euroland, I don't think that there, there should be too much concern as far as uh, the European Central Bank is concerned that um, the rises that we're seeing or the, or the rebound that we're seeing in producer price inflation will feed through. Producer price inflation in any case is still very, very low. With, the, with, this, uh, with that view of the oil price, with talk of flexibility on interest rates um, from, from the ECB, does that mean that this 40 basis point sell-off that we've seen in European 10-year bonds is going to halt around here? This isn't the beginning of a bond market route, right? we're going to find some stability and even rebound? I would say so, yes. I think that we may see a further rise in yields of around 10 basis points, again related to um, activity on the equity markets. But, but really and truly, if you look at where equity markets now versus the start of the year, we're still lower. And I think that demonstrates that what we're seeing is, is a rebound that's been predominantly led um, by the, the, the removal of uncertainty as far as conflict in Iraq is concerned. And it's not that people are happy to hold equity over bonds anymore. And I think think that we will see a reversal of those moves and I'm not so sure that we've seen a lows in bonds yet. I know that we've seen a 40 basis point rally and I know we're talking about a further 10 basis points on the 10 year but I do think that going forward that we could, could actually see European and US bonds hitting new, new lows for the, the, uh, the session so I do think that um, the rally shouldn't be overplayed as far as investors are concerned. Neil, thank you very much for that. Neil Parker, Treasury Economist at the Royal Bank of Scotland. Uh, Guy, let's, let's come back to you for a moment here uh, before we take another update from our friends at MSNBC on what is going on in the Gulf. Uh, we, we were discussing a little bit the, the, the strategy. A 
find it really hard to be bullish about equities sort of after the conflict. What would be your current reasoning for seeing, once Iraq is resolved here, the market rising given the current concerns about economic slowdowns, the valuation issue in the United States? Europe, I, I'd accept, and I think most people would, looks cheaper on a valuation matrix, but I'm asking myself why I would want to go out and buy equities in this current environment. Iraq may be one issue that's taken off the table subsequent to these events unfolding. There is still terrorism there. There are still other question marks about the equity markets and confidence in them. First of all, I think most of the bad news is priced in today. In the very short term, the key indicator for me is oil. As long as oil prices remain stable at this level or keep falling, I think that's a bullish signal for the equity markets. The second thing that supports me is that indicators other than equities are looking positive. Gold has come back, this uh, bond sell-off that we've seen it indicates slightly more confidence in activity underneath. Other commodity prices have rolled over, corporate bond spreads have continued to narrow. Most exciting of, of all for me is the third indicator is that M&A is beginning to take off in a serious way. We've seen Centre Pulse this morning from Smith and, ne Smith and Nephew, we've mm. seen Cisco make another purchase, we've seen a whole raft of MBOs coming out, all right, six continents has failed and Safeways is stalled, but every day we seem to see activity in MBO and MBO moves here. Finally, I think that the yield on equities in many markets remains at or very close to 10-year bonds, and that's making the assumption of no dividend growth for a decade going ahead. So I don't see this as a pent-up, huge bull run, but I think there is good support here. Most of the bad news that you've given is already priced into markets. We'll come back, we'll talk some more. Uh, you mentioned a few company names. I think it's appropriate for us to give you an update on the latest corporate news this morning. Let's take you through that now. Several of the world's largest airlines, including United Airlines, American Airlines, and Air Canada have announced job cuts and cuts to flight schedules in the wake of the war. Others such as Lufthansa, Swissair and Finnair have said that they are looking into ways to cut costs. Inditex's 2002 net profit rose 29%. That was lower than expectations as a slowdown in December sales held back growth. <coughs> sales of the group were also just under expectations, but still up 22% on last year at 3.97 billion euros. Uh, Euronext full year net profit seen at one point, or rather 157.9 million euros, that is up 24% from last year. Euronext uh, is the body that operates exchanges in the Netherlands, uh, Brussels, uh, Paris, uh, and that's about it, I think. Uh, if I've missed one, you'll tell me. Let's get out to Guy Johnson here on the markets desk. Uh, let's bring in our other reporters from around Europe. Uh, John Holland joins us from Frankfurt. Shelley Carabel, live from Paris. I think interesting to have a look at how the public are reacting around Europe to what is going on in the Middle East and how the newspapers are reflecting that. Guy, let's come to you first. Well, the UK coverage is certainly very much focused on the war at the moment. The, uh, the UK public opinion debates obviously continues to rage strongly. Tony Blair delivering his address last night saying we have a deeply divided country but we must now pull together. The UK papers pick up on what has been happening out in the war. Mass destruction is what is called by the Mirror this morning. Um, with paper, with a picture across the front uh, and the back cover, uh, a continuous picture showing some of the destruction that has been taking place. Uh, in terms of the broadsheets, a war beyond all other wars is the, uh, the, ti is the title from the Times. Uh, if we come back to the other tabloids, we're talking about uh, battle for Basra. Obviously, that is the first target that many people are talking about here. Let's find out exactly how the other countries are reporting events at the moment. Obviously, the focus on the war and also uh, the meeting last night between senior leaders from around Europe and how that's being covered. Let's start out in Paris with Shelley Carabel. Shelley, how are the papers reporting the differing events that we've seen uh, both from the Middle East and here in Europe? It's interesting to see the same picture. This is Le Figaro. Saddam is target number one, it says. That same picture is on Liberation, which is uh, the Figaro tends to be right-leaning. This is left-leaning. The Marines in Iraq, it's the same photograph. We're seeing a lot of coverage, of course, of, of, uh, of the war events, calling it an Anglo-Saxon uh, or British-American uh, 
uh, the uh, an Anglo-American offensive commencing. Uh, George Bush wanting Saddam at any price. Maybe you can see that here, a picture of the White House. Uh, and on the editorial pages, well, there's also, I should say, there's also a lot of coverage here. You have the youth against the war. You can see that. Yesterday's demonstrations during the afternoon of several thousand students uh, in, the, uh, in the streets of Paris near the American Embassy and consequently near our bureau here as well. And as a result, a lot of the streets have been continued to be blocked off. We've also seen a little bit of a, of a calming down in rhetoric. Now, let me see if I can find that. Uh, they talk about the fundamentalism, this isn't easy guys, the fundamentalism of George Bush uh, uh, regarding uh, his, his aims. There is a poll as well that suggests that, hang on, that suggests that 92% of the people here support Jacques Chirac's position. 62% uh, uh, believe that the international position of France is reinforced, at least within the European Union, that the, uh, go well, the war for petrol is, is really the issue, and 87% are against the military intervention of the United States in Iraq. Well, Guy, over here in Frankfurt, we've got uh, a, a bit of a, a cross-section of papers this morning. The Handelsblatt here reporting Baghdad under fire here. Basically, the Handelsblatt is saying, this is from our, our colleague Tom Knipp, Bush may well win the war. He says he wants to make the world a safer place, but Handelsblatt actually doubts that uh, the world will be a safer place as it will encourage Islamic extremism. That from the uh, Handelsblatt this morning. Die Welt, meanwhile, saying here, the offensive against Iraq has begun. Thousands of Germans take to the streets. Europe as an institution, according to, Handels, uh, to Die Welt, is currently a mountain of ruins. He's saying that uh, in their, uh, their uh, editorial that the, the historic UK-French uh, animosity continues. The need for a common European defense policy and foreign policy is as strong as ever. And war, paraphrasing, paraphrasing de Gaulle, often brings to light things that would best be left buried. Back to you. Thank you, John. Uh, well, I'm just looking at the Scandinavian newspaper sites on the Internet, and it seems that there's uh, quite a lot of talk uh, regarding the protests that have been against the war from the, uh, the locals uh, around the world, really. We've seen uh, various uh, protests in the U.S. We've, we've also seen various protests uh, around in Europe, and they are highlighting this. Uh, there's also a bit of talk about how, how uh, Bush actually gave attacks for the orders 12 hours before the actual deadline. So, in effect, he breached his own promise. To, to give uh, 48 hours and gave 36 hours instead. And finally, also, there is some talk about Saddam threatening with suicide bombs. This is according to one of the very large tabloids uh, in Scandinavia. But that, of course, is also just uh, one of the widespread rumors that is out in the marketplace, Guy, about uh, what Saddam could do. Certainly, and that is obviously the great fear being reflected in many of the papers. It is interesting to see, though, that we've uh, got the notes, the tone from Paris and Frankfurt. The overall sentiment there continuing that this is an Anglo-Saxon war uh, and treating it as such. Quite a negative um, overtones being generated from those papers, obviously reflecting the strong public opinion, uh, which is very much against the war within uh, those countries. And I think the, the stark contrast with the, uh, the UK papers, which is very much sort of pro our boys in, con in, conflict, uh, in conflict. Uh, so uh, different interpretations being placed around uh, the European papers this morning. Thank you, Shelley Carabell. Thank you, John Holland. Obviously, thank you, Louisa. Uh, and we will be back with the market uh, opens fairly soon. But, Jeff, back to you. All right, Guy, thanks very much for that. Let's get out to Washington now. Jessica Yellen joins us once again, NBC's correspondent in Washington. Uh, nice to have you back with us on CNBC Europe. Jessica, what news this morning from the White House? The White House right now has been saying that they feel so far reports from the battlefield are encouraging. They have been cautious in the comments they make publicly, but so far express pleasure with the way the war has gone so far. Particularly pleased that there are signs that top Iraqi leadership may already be crumbling. Now, before the president went to bed, he did get news that that Marine helicopter crashed with 16 U.S. and British troops aboard. Of course, that dampening his spirit uh, right uh, 
uh, at the beginning of this war. He made no comment on that crash, but I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him come before cameras later today to express his condolences to their families. Uh, the president retired to the White House overnight. Before that, he got a late night briefing by Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, uh, National Security Advisor Dr. Rice, and he's expected to go to Camp David later today. Uh, but the message you're hearing from every branch of this administration is one of certainty that there will be coalition victory, that Saddam Hussein will be overthrown um, if he hasn't been killed already. And officials still aren't saying if they do believe Saddam Hussein is dead or alive. Jeff. Jessica, we're getting various reports of um, oil heads being alight in southern Iraq. This was prior to the offensive starting one of the uh, stated uh, fears of the allied forces. They had hoped that they could prevent these oil fields being set alight. Are you hearing anything from the White House or in Washington from any arm of the government about the consequences of that action? The White House won't comment on that, has not done so. The Pentagon saying now that they expected this all along, it wasn't what they wanted, but definitely downplaying the significance of that, that it is still manageable. And again, they feel upbeat about the way they've managed this so far. So if there are internal worries, they're not sharing them publicly. We're not hearing rumors of that. Again, they're really focusing on the positive and especially on these rumored defections of members of the Iraqi Republican Guard, which it would be both a big political victory as well as strategic one for them. And we can talk more about that if you'd like. Yeah, the, I wanted to ask you, you, you mentioned um, the, the issue of whether Saddam Hussein survived the uh, attack on the bunker in, in the first opening salvos of the war here. Confirmation, we understand here in Europe from the Pentagon that Saddam Hussein was in that bunker. Are you hearing anything at all about injuries, casualties from that offensive? This, there are a lot of reports coming out about this, and nothing that has been confirmed by the administration. They really are being tight-lipped and saying they're still doing analysis. Uh, what we've heard is they uh, believe that that video that, uh, where Saddam Hussein appeared on television was, in fact, Saddam Hussein. They don't know when that was taped, though, so it could have been beforehand. There was a report um, that's been moving on the wires here saying that there were uh, calls placed to an area hospital um, in Baghdad after that attack, suggesting that Saddam Hussein had been in some way at least injured. Um, but again, no confirmation from the White House, and they just are playing this one very close to the vest, and uh, we're waiting for any word from them, but they're just not sharing it. What is the president's agenda like for the day, uh, Friday, in, in the United States? What can we expect to be hearing from the government? Uh, first, I would expect the president might again make some comment to the families of those uh, troops that were on board that uh, helicopter that crashed. He is going to the uh, Camp David, as I said, and has no public events scheduled. It might seem curious that he's leaving the White House. Um, a suspicion, just speculation, that he'd like to look as though it's just business as usual. Um, he's in a position of power, and this is not affecting uh, the way he would go about his life normally. Um, but he will continue to get briefings regularly from Donald Rumsfeld and Condoleezza Rice. He says he's constantly in touch with them and prepared to come back or travel um, for any reason whatsoever. But they say they just can't plan the president's moves um, m much more than hours in advance because they have to be loose and flexible uh, during war. Jessica, thank you very much for being with us. Jessica Yellen, NBC correspondent at the NBC Bureau in Washington. Let's uh, take you up to the open for the markets here in Europe. We need to keep uh, an eye across these. Guy, uh, what do we need to know? Uh, in terms of the markets this morning, Jeff, remember they finished, for instance, in London, absolutely bang flat yesterday, uh, just holding on to some gains. Other markets not having so uh, good a day. Uh, today, the CAC futures are indicating right now that we are likely to trade up into positive territory. But again, it's likely to be another day of headline watching. The oil price will come under a great deal of pressure. Oil stocks yesterday were a significant driver of this market and are likely to remain so. Remember, they are heavily capped. Uh, in terms of other news, we are likely to uh, be looking uh, at a series of uh, pieces uh, of information being generated from defence stocks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the airline stocks, all of these are likely uh, to come under increasing scrutiny throughout the day.
Yeah, another thing, Guy, is uh, watch the insurers. Watch the insurers and watch the financials. Uh, they were quite weak yesterday. We did see uh, some drops coming through, for an example, from Allianz on the back of news of their rights issue. Uh, Allianz will definitely be one to watch uh, today to see uh, the follow-up and whether or not we see a follow-up uh, coming through in Allianz, for an example. Let me also just show you uh, what we're looking at in the currencies. That will be one area also where you'll definitely want to keep your eye on currencies. Uh, pretty flat trading right now, 106.0 seven is where we stand. Uh, we didn't see all that much movement yesterday compared to what some people were expected on the back of that initial attack uh, and thoughts are today that we will see uh, more of this flat trading going forward. But of course the commodities uh, is uh, an area where you will want to definitely uh, keep your eye on it as well. Uh, uh, also of course uh, uh, Brent and, uh, and Nymex. Let's go to Guy now for a lot more on this area. Guy. Yeah, let's start getting some details about how these markets are likely to open here in Europe. We've just gone past the hour. The European markets will be opening as we speak. Ireland up into positive territory already. The European markets will gradually filter through over the next 10 or 20 seconds. Uh, we're starting to see Denmark already up into positive territory. The CAC here on the ZDAX, the FTSE 100. We'll take a couple of minutes uh, for these trades to start come through. There you go. Germany up into positive territory. We're trading positively in, the, uh, in Frankfurt already this morning. Other markets are expects to open so higher but it is likely to be a cautious session. Obviously, many people will be watching the headlines, trying to determine exactly what it means for their trades when it comes to the war. London now open, up just a fraction. It finished absolutely flat yesterday. An indication, really, of just the level of nervousness of these markets, just an absolutely neutral position being established. The Zetradax now tipping down just a fraction, down around four-tenths of 1%. But so far, it looks as if we are getting a reasonably flat open. Portugal, absolutely flat. We're seeing the Bell 20 opening up just in positive territory, but not a great deal. Only up around half of 1%. London now up two tenths of 1%, uh, and just beginning to sort of stabilize a little bit. Uh, we're now getting the AEX. It's opened up seven tenths of 1% at the moment. Uh, so we're gradually getting there. Paris now moving into the fray as well. We've got the Paris market opening up around nine tenths of 1%, around, around uh, one tenth of 1%, uh, sorry, around 1% uh, open this morning. Let's take a look and try and get some details details of these markets in a little more specifics now. Let's start off and find out exactly how these markets are positioning themselves. FTSE 100 up three tenths of one percent. We've got the Zetra DAX uh, up just a zero, but absolutely flat. Uh, and the CAC Hurant up 1.03 percent right now. Uh, in terms of where we stand there, as you can see, we're obviously waiting for the SMI to give us uh, a trade there. Spain has just opened up eight tenths of one percent. Let's get and find out what's happening over in Paris. Let's get uh, to the, to the, uh, the CAC here on trade. At the moment, we are up some 1% at the moment. Let's find out exactly what is happening. Shelley Carabell, our Paris bureau chief, as you can see behind me, ready and standing by watching the trades. Shelley, how does it look? <laughs> Uh, it looks very green, uh, actually, Guy. We're up uh, 26 points, and that's over 1%, 28, 21. We're looking for support at 27, 44, and 2770. So far, though, the movement's on the upside. Resistance at 28, 20, so we're already over that, and 28, 86. Uh, on the upside, Thompson, AXA, Renault, Dexia, uh, those are some of the insurance and financial stocks that we saw getting hit yesterday, although we're covering later in the day. And then, of course, Thompson Software, a lot of it for defense, uh, and Renault Cars. Now, on the downside, earlier we had seen Vancy, the only stock in the red here. Now we've got a couple of Ventus, uh, PPR, and Vancy. PPR, of course, one of the uh, luxury goods stocks, are focusing on luxury goods, uh, but that's it. none of these are, are a lot in the red. So the, the emphasis right now is on is on the green. Producer prices in February rose 0.7% month on month, up 2.6% on the year. Uh, a lot of this was driven by oil prices. Uh, and we saw Saint-Gobain, Euronext in line with expectations for year profits. And Air France says they'll tell us Wednesday about flights being rescheduled. And we'll have more for you in a little while. Shelley, thanks very much indeed. Let's get out to Frankfurt now, where the market is trading up just two tenths of one percent, flattish open. Dan Scott is uh, is uh, standing by in Frankfurt to give us the latest details. Dan, what's moving the market this morning, or is it just nervousness, just waiting to see what happens in the war? 
You know, there's a lot of volatility right now, and it's not all too surprising for today's session, not just because of the war on Iraq that we're experiencing right now, and of course the nerves that that puts investors on, especially on development of how oil prices are going to uh, progress, but also because today is a day where we have a triple witch for these markets. That means index futures, index options, and also individual stock options will all expire by the end of today's trading session, and so that is also going to put some extra volatility into these markets. The way most of the market players think that this is going going to pan out is that it's going to cause for some rising stock prices that people are going to continue buying into these markets and then and then uh, after we get the expiry of most of the uh, futures on especially on the index and options on the index that then we might see some profit taking as people try and clear out their positions before the weekend so that's going to be a focus for today but otherwise take a look at an Infineon that stock is having some very strong gains on the back of the EU saying that it will likely put on import tariffs onto DRAM chips supplied by Hynix back to you. Dan, thanks very much indeed. A volatile session in Frankfurt, likely to be again a volatile session over in London. The market just finishing in positive territory yesterday, but only just. Oils were a big feature. Insurance stocks continue to be so. Let's find out what's going on in London. Steve Sedgwick uh, is standing by to give us the details uh, from the British capital. Guy, yeah, the London market this morning is opening slightly stronger than we expected, actually. We're up around about 25 points, once again trying to get above that key 3,800 level. It's a level we've tried to challenge a couple of times this week and haven't managed to get over as of yet. We're currently trading at 37.90. But Dan talking about triple witching over in Germany, certainly the biggest feature non-Iraq related for the London market today will be the double witching. We haven't got equity options expiry. We had that one on Wednesday. So we've got index options and index futures expiring today between 10.10 and 10.30 GMT. Obviously stick an hour on that for the CET time. But obviously it could be incredibly volatile time. One thing we have seen, a big feature of these markets as of late in the last six months is increased volatility uh, and also a lot of people have been blaming the derivatives market for this because the life assurers uh, hedging their long equity positions to wor on their wires of solvency have actually got into derivatives in a big way shorting futures buying downside puts and selling upside calls now obviously the market has moved around very aggressively in that six month period and especially uh, in the last week which has brought alive so to speak a lot of these option positions we think the life assurers are rolling out a lot of positions to forward months, forward future months like June and forward equity option contract months uh, in between March and June. So it could be very volatile uh, for that time. Don't forget back in September we saw the most volatile FTSE session ever uh, on the back of one of these expiries. But uh, overall no big corporate stories to go, uh, today Guy. Uh, obviously everyone's watching Iraq. Back to you. Yeah thanks very much indeed Steve. Let's just run you through the stocks to give you an idea of how we're shaking out this morning. These are the most active stocks ever already. Novartis, UBS, Credit Suisse all in there and all trading actively. Novartis Novartis up 6.2, UBS up 2.2, and Credit Suisse up 4.7. If we move forward, let me just go back actually and just show you the gainers. The, uh, Novartis is our main gainer. Diageo also trading higher, as is Philips. Probably a chip story related there on the Hynix story. Arhold and France Telecom. Downside, let's just go back and show you. There we go. Oh, we're going to get there eventually. BASF is the only stock we have in negative territory. Let's try and fill in some of the other gaps and figure out exactly what's going on. Louisa is standing by for that. Thank you, Guy. Let me just point out on the equity side of things, we do also have the futures expiry, of course, happening today in a number of markets. So that's something uh, to watch out for as well and something that will affect our markets and trading. Brent is now open out of London, uh, trading up by eight tenths of one percent at 25.70. You can just uh, see it bleeping upward just slightly. We did see Brent yesterday drop almost five percent, which means uh, that it has hit new three month lows uh, yesterday on the back of uh, the U.S. military president ahead towards Iraq. Of course, this morning there's been uh, new news out uh, regarding uh, U.S. troops and allied troops overtaking uh, several oil wells out of Iraq. And we've also heard of news of some of these oil wells uh, having been set afire. But Brent now trading up at 25.70. Let me just show you NYMEX also for the week and what it's done to give you the full picture on the oil front. NYMEX up by 1.5% uh, yesterday, uh, but having, uh, having again reached a level of pretty much a stability within the past couple of days. 28.53 is where NYMEX stands. If we can just very briefly show you this NYMEX chart. Uh, no. All right. Let's go back to Jeff. All right, Louisa, thanks very much for that. We'll do the NYMEX chart in just a moment or two. We've got some fresh pictures that we need to bring you here uh, from MSNBC. These are shots Came of earlier, Iraqis right there, in southern Iraq, the we presume. More than they are surrendering to allied forces. We do not know exactly where this 
surrendering is taking place, but as you can see, they have all put their hands on top of their heads to make sure they are not able to reach for any sort of armor, any sort of equipment they might have on them. This, uh, they are surrendering, obviously, in the face of the vast U.S.-led coalition that is coming into the region, perhaps having been daunted by the air power and now foot soldier power we see in the region. Uh, let's also get back to you, NBC's Fred Francis, and bring you in on this. You talked about the Republican Guard Division no longer being there in the region of Mosul. When were they removed from there, Fred, and were they removed by, by force at all, or did they get out to save their own skins? Do you no. know the background?